Well, good morning. Welcome to Belvoir Chapel. We're so glad that you're here this morning. Um, I'm, I'm like Chaplain Porter was last week, kind of like still wondering when spring is going to really get here. Um, but, but I acknowledge from uh, John's comments uh, last week before his prayer as well that the signs are out there. I noticed that some of the trees were a little greener this morning and uh, it looks a little bit like spring, but for me, just still, uh, especially as a Texas boy, it doesn't quite feel like spring. But it is coming, and it's a, a great time to come together this morning. No matter what the weather's like outside, in here, we are warm because we gather in the Lord's name. And I'm so thankful that you've come here this morning. If you are new, uh, a visitor, our guest this morning, We'd like for you to just slip your hand up so that one of our ushers can bring a welcome card to you this morning. If there's anyone here that's new, just slip your hand up. Thank you. And uh, it's just an opportunity for us to invite you back. That's all it is. And uh, we're glad that you're here. Of course, we're glad that everyone is here this morning. So uh, I want you to encourage you to, to look at your bulletin for a list of announcements going on. But I want to highlight a few things this morning for our congregation. Our offering uh, today is designated for Samaritan's Purse, and uh, we're going to have another opportunity next Sunday uh, as well for that ministry. And it's a terrific ministry. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the wonderful things that they do. And uh, uh, certainly they have uh, folks serving uh, those in, in need in Ukraine. And of course, we're all familiar with their Operation Christmas Child and uh, so just a wonderful ministry. We appreciate the generosity that you show to them this morning. Uh, of course, today is Palm Sunday, and that means that next Sunday is a very special Sunday. And I know you uh, are looking forward to our opportunities to worship together as, uh, as our Easter celebration comes up. So don't forget next week, uh, a little bit different schedule. We have a 0630 sunrise at the Officers Club. No 08 service here, uh, but we will reconvene at 11 for a service together. So we hope that you'll find an opportunity to worship with us, perhaps even worship with us several different times. And then also our care groups are, um, are being developed, and, and that's coming up here in a couple of weeks. So uh, we look forward to that. There's this great uh, insert in the bulletin, so please take a look at those opportunities, and we invite you to become part of that ministry. So uh, again, uh, take a look at your opportunity to get involved, those things listed in the bulletins, and, and those things that you might be aware of otherwise. We want you to be part of this ministry in so many ways, and so if there's something here that's uh, right up your alley in the way that God has called you, then we invite you to be a part of that. If there's something that you want to do that you don't see listed or you haven't heard about, then please uh, visit with one of the chaplains. We want to hear uh, how the Lord is working in your life and in your heart. All right. So our call to worship. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Let us pray. Almighty God, may your spirit be upon us this morning as we have gathered in your name. Come and be among us as our king. Bestow your blessing upon every aspect of our worship this morning in song, in prayer, fellowship together, giving, and proclamation. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing from number 301, We Will Glorify. 301, We Will Glorify.
gathered on this Palm Sunday to acknowledge you as King. You are King of kings and Lord of lords, the object of our affection. Receive our worship now in your holy name, I pray. As we remain standing for number 297, Hosanna, loud, loud Hosanna. Amen. Well, you are going to get a chance to have your own palm branch this morning. At the end of the service, we invite you to uh, take one at the back as you leave and as you go down to the fellowship hall to grab some refreshment and fellowship with um, our fellow believers. So right now, turn to one another and greet one another with Christ's love, please. Amen. Well, I still enjoy that part of our service, don't you? Uh, just turn to one another with a smile and with the greeting of Christ's love. It's terrific. So now we proceed with our confession of faith. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I want to invite you this morning in a time of confession. I'll pray for us together and give you a moment in your own time and in your own way to confess to the Lord and then receive an assurance of pardon. Let us pray. Holy God, in your presence, we recognize our failings. 
sharing in Isaiah's confession, we have unclean lips and we live among a people of unclean lips. We confess our sins to you this morning. We confess that we have not loved you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we ask humbly for your forgiveness while boldly approaching your throne of grace. Amen. Please take a moment to privately confess your sins before God. Now receive this assurance of pardon from the book of Romans. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Will the ushers come this morning for our time of offering? Father, bless the giver and bless these gifts for your name. May you be glorified in them. Amen. Let's stand for the doxology.
Amen. You may be seated. The word of the Lord from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9a, on page 611 of your hymn Bible, your pew Bible. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with the word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens, he awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheek to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? And from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 44, on page 878. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, whereon, entering, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, and so those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat, Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let us pray for one another. Our loving Father, we lift up to you the needs of your children, knowing of your steadfast love for us. We pray for your works of healing for the many suffering, sickness, and injury of the body and the mind. Bring them the healing they so desperately desire. Thank you for those who have already received your healing touch. And for those who experience health by your mercies. Lord, we also bring to your throne the many who are heartbroken by the death of a loved one. Comfort them in their time of grief, reminding them always that through Christ, death has been overcome. We lift up our brothers and sisters across the globe who face persecution because they follow Christ. Grant them the strength to face their persecutors and bestow heavenly peace upon those that are facing persecution unto death for the sake of the gospel. Lord, we do not forget the lost among us. May they hear your voice calling them to repentance and faith. May the faithful observances of your people during this special week be a witness to the world that results in millions bowing their knees to you for the first time. Continue you to watch over our nation's servants in the military, especially those deployed to foreign lands. Grant them safety, success, and a meaningful return to their families and friends. 
Be with Chaplain Wake this morning as he brings your word to us. That he communicates clearly the things that you have given to him throughout his time of preparation. That we might be inspired, that we might hear, that we might change our behavior by your grace and by your mercy. Father, continue to be with all those who call upon your name for whatever need it might be. We know that you are with us. These things we add to our prayer in the way that our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, let us stand once again and give thanks for God's grace through Him, number 316, O sacred head now wounded. Number 316. Please be seated. Well, it is fantastic to have the opportunity to take a break from John, our book that we're proceeding through, so that we can pause to talk about Palm Sunday and the Easter Sunday morning and the celebration that we have once a year, Christ and his coming. Now, the story of Christ being told is told in a lot of different ways, and we're going to read from Matthew here in a minute, as we've already read from Luke about this triumphal entry. And I'm reminded of how does this get portrayed? How do you, 
actually put this onto a medium, you know. Now, some of you may have seen already the Easter uh, services, uh, the, the screening of things like Ben-Hur or The Robe or some classic movie. There's different Jesus movies that have come out, Jesus of Nazareth and, and such. There's even now currently uh, this television series called The Chosen, which is very good, that just, just displays this story, gives us a sense of what was going on. Now, I'm going to take a little different tact on that, and it's called reality TV. Now, I'm not necessarily uh, addicted to reality TV. I'm not binge-watching as much as I used to during the pandemic, but, you know, now I don't have to. And, you know, reality TV has got this different way in which it's going to portray the script, so to speak. Now, first, the whole concept of reality is reality. It's life being lived out loud right in front of people. There is no script, right? So how do they actually take and watch people do things in life and bring it to television that we all want to watch it? Let, let's just think about that for a second. If someone was going to be videotaping my life, I'm pretty sure no one's going to want to watch it. That's not going to be high on the Nielsen ratings, right? If they even do Nielsen ratings anymore. So how do they do it? Well, you take maybe something that people would be interested, take a famous person, a famous family, a famous group of people, or maybe you want to see how people do things like, I'm into the reno shows, you know, like HGTV. I'll watch something about, you know, Rock This Kitchen or uh, Fixer Upper or something like that, right? So I like that. That's reality TV. But even that, which is more staged because they're doing it in this little box, you don't know there's going to be any drama, right? I mean, they go in there, they fix everything, it's fine. Then the next episode, they go in there and find out you've got termites or some other problem, right? So how do, how do the producers figure this out? Why do we keep coming back and watching boring people do boring things? Well, a producer has to put that all together. In concept, they take tons of video. If you've ever been involved... If, if you've ever seen the behind the scenes type of stuff of reality TV, there is just a lot of video being taken, hoping that sometime during a given day, there's something that's worth watching, right? So th there's a lot out there. And then the producer afterwards has to put all of that in together and edit it. It's not a director, because remember, it's unscripted. So no one's out there telling people how to, to play the part. So the producer afterwards looks at hours and hours and hours of video and pieces it all together and see if there's a storyline, something that goes along. And remember, we got 26 episodes, so we got to stretch this puppy out. It can't be just one storyline. And, and they're going to put it all together. And then in the end, you're going to say, wow, that was a good season. I want to see what happens next year. Our gospel writer of Matthew is helping us see the life of Christ as he details it in his gospel message. He's our producer. He's, he's writing after seeing all that has transpired and is able to start piecing the pieces and parts together and see how this is connected to prophecy and how this is connected to what's coming up next. And in this moment in time, we're going to unpack what is happening when Jesus comes into Jerusalem. He's going to drop, you're going to love this, he's going to drop a couple of Easter eggs for us. Now, do you know what an Easter egg is in the media realm? That's when you're watching something and you really don't see this little nugget of truth and then later on you go watch it again. Or for those that are really into some type of, there's some storyline or some little uh, drop in that's behind somebody in a scene, there's an Easter egg, you know, like they had their picture when they were in high school or something back there. And if you've watched the movie enough times, you start catching the little, little pieces and parts. They're kind of cute very appropriate for our season to have Easter eggs. Matthew is giving us Easter eggs in his passage, so I'll ask you to open up to Matthew 21. And we're going to see how the producer showed us what Christ is doing here and now, as well as what he was doing in the first century. Matthew 21, we've read from the Luke passage, but this is the, the Matthew take on Jesus coming into the... Uh, the, the town of Jerusalem, Matthew 21, starting in verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied 
and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks, says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill, fulfill what was spoken in the prophet, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds went before him and followed, were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus and Naz from Nazareth of Galilee. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Verse 1, just the first half first one, one A, sets the story. Now, number one, we know that Jesus is later in his time as a teacher in his time, but again, the producer doesn't know how this is all going to transpire. And he's detailing for us some of the set, seed setter. Here we are on the Mount of Olives looking out over the city. This is the scene. Now, the city and the geography, if you did not know this in the scriptures, when they uh, referred to going up to the, the Temple Mount, the Temple Mount was literally high in the tip of Jerusalem. It was in the higher elevation. It looked out over the city. But for him to be on the Mount of Olives and looking out onto the city meant that it's also there. And so the Mount of Olives sits on one side of the city. There's the Kidron Valley that you'd have to go down and into, and then you'd come back out into the city itself and go up into the Temple Mount. It's actually why, if you've ever wondered, north, south, east, west, when it says that we're going up to Jerusalem, it's not that they were going north or south, it was that they were going higher in elevation. And when they were going to go down to Bethlehem, that's because it's lower in elevation. It doesn't mean it's going south or north or whatever. They actually, that's very specific in the scriptures, when they talk about where they're going, that elevation dictates. So what's interesting about this is that he's looking out over this, and automatically we already get a vision of the messianic message that the producer is bringing in. Because in Zechariah 14.4, it says this, talking about the nation of Israel being redeemed, Zechariah 14.4, on that day, the day of his coming, his feet will stand in the Mount of Olives out of Jerusalem. It, it sets the scene. It goes on to talk about splitting rocks and, and there will be great calamity, but it is to call on the king has come, that the, the Lord God is back. That's what Zechariah is giving us that prophecy. So automatically there is a sense that this is bigger than the normal visit to Jerusalem. That the producer is probably, if we've seen there's been visits here and there to different towns, but now Jesus is coming to Jerusalem and he's standing just like the prophet had told of old in Zechariah 14.4. If I were to go over two pages in Matthew's account, later in the week, he is looking out, and in Matthew uh, 23, he says this, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and the stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until the, you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This lament that Jesus gives, and I know that the second service, he's, uh, Chapman Prost is going to be talking about the, 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 the lament that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. There, it's an important distinction here because our producer is having to capture these little snippets of time and see how Jesus is interacting with the people. We haven't seen him actually enter into Jerusalem in Matthew 23. We're, we're here in Matthew 21, but in Matthew 23, he says that same refrain, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There's this step by step. Well, where does that come from? That is actually a quote from Zechariah, Zechariah 9.9, where they have this idea of the prophecy once again. So we see that indeed 
the producer is bringing these pieces and parts together right off the get-go. Now, we set up the whole scene. Jesus has set uh, in place what is supposed to happen. In verse 2 and following, he's going to go down and he sends the disciples to go get a colt. Now, I'm kind of reminded of this is Jesus, the son of the living God, the omniscient one, the one that knows all things, and yet does he really know that there's going to be these two animals down south? Or is it more like, I know a guy. And you're going to go down there and you see the guy. He's going to take care of you. He's going to do what you need to do. We don't know for sure. When, when, when we see this part of the scenery, it's, he's giving instructions to the disciples, something he's done for three years of ministry now. And, and miraculous things have happened around the disciples. They're getting used to the fact of just, just do what the, the guy says, right? Just go down there and you're going to find a couple of animals. And he says to them, if they should ask, where, where are you taking the animals? They say, well, the master needs them. It's another Easter egg, isn't it? The master. You mean the guy who owns the animals, the master? Or do you mean, oh, the master? God incarnate is come with us. The, man, the one who can calm the wind and the waves. The one who can do raising people from the dead that he's already done. Is that, that the master, or is it just the guy who owns the animals? Either way, the storyline works for the disciples, doesn't it? They're able to go down and talk to the guy and get the animals to set up this, what is, again, a messianic, prophecy-fulfilling moment. If I'm the producer and I have taken and seen Christ do wondrous, miraculous things in these little snippets of time, all of a sudden I see this innocuous moment where he just goes just go down and see some people they've got some horses we're going to take those into the city and it turns out wait wait i remember that that is again the, it, it actually quotes from zechariah 9 9 I, I misspoke zechariah 9 9 is this say to the daughter of zion behold your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey on a colt the full of beast of bird what a miraculous difference from what other conquering heroes would have come into the temple city to the the capital city of jerusalem if that would have been true then there would be some guy in armor or you know wonderfully clad on a huge horse something that's going to show his power and his glory and those things instead he comes on a donkey very plain man there would be no separating the fact that this is just another traveler coming in but people start throwing their cloaks out there. They start getting all excited. Well, why is that? Because I think, again, much like Matthew seeing the Easter egg in this, they're seeing something messianic. We shouldn't forget the fact that these crowds that are here in this moment in time are most likely those that came with him from Galilee. That's why at the end they know him. So the crowds that are getting excited have been excited as they've been transporting themselves down there. Now, why are they in Jerusalem? They're there for the Passover feast. To them, it's not the last Passover feast. We do this every year. Christ knows better. You know, it may be an unscripted reality story, but in fact, Christ does know better. He does know all things, like where the animals are, how this is going to play itself out, the lament that we hear later on in the week. Christ knows all things. But to the disciples and to the people who have been following Christ and his teachings, this is exciting. He's coming into the city, and it's, it's, it's just like the conquerors of old. This has this hearkening of something we've seen before. Man, this is something we could get into. I keep on wondering if Christ lamented just a little bit about knowing his story and their excitement, this juxtaposition of, they're so excited for what he's coming. And he keeps on saying, but you don't know what's coming. It's an interesting way in which our reality tale continues to unfold. Well, it, the story works out fine. Verse 6, the disciples went and did as he answered him. No one really seemed to bug him about that. And this is where it gets even more. We amp up and we see the crowds get excited most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds went before him saying, Hosanna, the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now that's important because that is a refrain from 
Uh, Psalm 118, 26. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Psalm 118 makes us hearken to the kings of Israel. This, this idea that the king is coming and a messianic king that they have been foretold for centuries. They're excited to hear this unfolding. It kind of makes me think of uh, a more modern connection to uh, a play. I, I'm, maybe some of you have either seen it on TV, maybe you had the opportunity to see the play in New York. I think it's coming through Washington. It's, it's Hamilton. So the story of Hamilton is about Alexander Hamilton, done to much more upbeat music, and it's pretty good. I mean, I enjoyed watching it. But near the end of the first act, as they're continuing to go through the Revolutionary War, the idea of you know, breaking the bonds with Britain, there's a, the anthem at the very end and the crescendo of the first act is uh, the Battle of Yorktown. And this is, it's, the name of the song is called World Turned Upside Down. Because this ragtag militia group was able to conquer, uh, not conquer, but to defeat what was considered the world-class army of the day in the, in the British at the Battle of Yorktown, which turned the tide and made it so that we would have the United States of America. And in that moment in time, there was a world turned upside down. Nobody had ever envisioned that this would ever happen. I don't know, in reality TV, if you get to those moments where you just, it's totally unscripted. No one saw that one coming. Our producer is putting all of these pieces and parts together. No one saw what was coming this week. But I think there was a crescendo of this is the one. This is the Messiah. All of these pieces and parts, this has got to be the coming king. And so they get excited and they start doing the things like a king would happen. In 2 Kings 9.31, it says this about a king of Israel. After Solomon and after they'd had some family... Family problem. Another good reality TV show would be David, Solomon, all that. But Second Kings says this. Then in haste, every man of them took his garment, put it under him, and put it on the bare steps, and blew the trumpet to proclaim, Jehu is king. It was this moment in time when we had a king of Israel that was a follower. He had pushed away Jezebel. And now they had a follower of God that could take over and start to do good things. It was short-lived, but it was a king of Israel. They knew this idea. So there's those cloaks that go down there. That's the idea that they've seen this. This is how you bring in a king of Israel. The entire Psalm 118, that Hosanna, is about the King David coming in, the Davidic kingdom, the greatness that was Israel of the days of old. These people have been waiting, chomping at the bit for this opportunity to celebrate what once was. Even today, the, the flight, fights in Israel with other, the West Bank and other territories is because they want to regain the status that they had under the time of David. The borders of Israel should be in the Davidic style. There's now other countries there. It was a large and prosperous kingdom under David. So our reality story is saying that they want to get back to that moment. It's a crescendo. It's coming forward that the king is here. We know it's true. But is that how this ends out? Is that how the week is going to end? That's the next episode, right? That's <laughs> It's where the reality TV just strings you along a little bit. You're going to have to see the rest of it coming up. I will tell you that we do end on a bang, which I really kind of like. They are so excited, and the crowds come, and they, they bring out their bows. I went and got my bow early. Sorry, Tom. I'm not, you're not allowed to have these until the end of the service, so you listen. But they start putting these down, and they start saying, this is the king. And so then the people start asking the question, verse 10. And he entered Jerusalem, and the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? The crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus of Nazareth of Galilee. All of these followers that would have been with him up in Galilee are now proclaiming, and the new Jerusalem people are like, oh, I, don't, I don't get it. What is going on? It says here that it stirred the whole city. So I did a little Greek little Greek seo is the term stirred. 
interesting, kind of an understatement of stirring the city. Matthew himself in Matthew 27, 51, at the time of Christ's death, he says this, using the same term, stirred. And behold, the curtain with temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The exact same words, seo, is either stirred or shook the world. Talk about an Easter egg. He uses a word that he's literally going to use a week later to talk about what is the world turned upside down by the acts of this man. That's, that's a mic drop. I mean, that's an opportunity to no kidding say, God is moving. In our text, people were stirred. What's going on? I'm interested. Is there a party going on? Can I go get in on this? No. God is moving. His king has come. Christ, the Messiah, is walking towards death, not because he is going to take over through some political overheaval and taking over the land. No, that he will conquer death and he will bring eternal life. Then we can get excited about a second coming. All of this is literally for the entire other series that's going to happen at the end of time when he comes and re-enters the kingdom the same way, but this time on a horse, this time as king of kings and lord of lords, and everyone will know it. There won't be anyone doubting it this time, going, is there somebody out there I'm supposed to know? No, they're going to know that this is the one and only son of the living God come down. That's for another series. What is exciting is Matthew has taken this entire element, one episode of our reality TV that is the life of God through his son Christ to us. We can see this history unfold, and it's exciting. I can tell you that I get excited about Easter every year because it is when we remember what God has done for us. It's too easy at times to forget. We, we go through the machinations, we go through the motions, we go church, you know, Sunday school, care groups, opportunities to fellowship to one another. Well, that's the reality TV, isn't it? That's real life. We're getting through this as a community of faith. But every once in a while, we have to take a pause. We have to go back, much like Passover for the old Jewish traditions, now for us to remember it's Christ as the king coming in so that we may have eternal life. We remember this joy of the celebration of, Easter, of Palm Sunday. There's a lot that's going to happen in the next couple of days. And then there's going to be this great celebration next Sunday when we know that he is alive. I'll let you watch the next episode with us. It'll be fun. A word of the Lord. I'll ask you to open up your hymnals to number 300. Seems appropriate to end with glory, loud, and honor. Number 300, please stand and sing as we sing together.
Amen. Don't forget to uh, receive your palm branch as you head out the doors and downstairs for our time of fellowship. Now receive the benediction. Father, we are so thankful for our time together this morning. Thank you for being with us and blessing us in so many ways this morning and certainly through the word that has been preached. May we this week be celebratory in every way as we look at Jesus Christ, our King, as we reflect on his final week and certainly as we look forward to that great and glorious celebration of Easter. Go with us now into this dark world, sharing your light of truth. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Go in peace.